Hello, welcome to our first online lecture at the Missouri River Regional Library Lecture Series. Today, we're going to talk about something I am absolutely passionate about. Science in our everyday lives. Specifically, the physics and chemistry behind a beer. Why talking about beer? Well, beer is a popular drink that transcends all boundaries, including race, socioeconomic status, country borders, and even continents. Here, we have a world map of beer consumption done by the Telegraph of the United Kingdom, showing the beer consumption per capita by country. We can see that while the United States has a high beer consumption, and that's why we, we have this uh, rich blue color in the map, other countries are leading the world in that aspect. Specifically, the country with the highest beer consumption per capita in the world is the Czech Republic. If we analyze the top beer consumption countries in the world are mostly in Europe. The US, however, is still leading the American continent. So we're not that far behind in taking the lead in this specific aspect. Now, what are the ingredients necessary to brew beer? The first one is malt. Malt is just dry germinated seeds of grain. Normally, malt by, for brewing beer can be made from a variety of, of grains. The most commonly used grain for malt is barley. Other beer varieties actually use wheat. So some certain beer styles, um, particularly the Weiss beer, which is very, very, very nice German beer, has a large proportion of wheat relative to the barley that is used in, the, in its malt. Beyond wheat, other grains that can be used for malt are sorghum, oats, rye, and even millet. So the main idea of, of these grains that are, are used for, for malt is provide a source of starch for our brewing purposes. The next ingredient that we need for making beer is hops. Hops have a strong contribution to beer brewing. Hop flowers are used to give flavor to beer. And there are many varieties of hops and all of them contribute to the bitterness that we can experience in the beer, we can taste in the beer. However, different varieties provide different flavors. Also, hops has antiseptic properties, so they also act as a preservative in, in our beer. Next ingredient is yeast, and yeast are going to play a main role in the production of ethyl alcohol in our, in our beer. Here we have a micrograph picture of a fermenting yeast that is used when we brew ale. And this specific uh, yeast is the Saccharomyces cerevisiae. The next ingredients that we need, it's of course water. You know, H2O. This is an absolutely marvelous chemical compound which is necessary for life in our planet, in other planets, as well as for brewing beer. So, what are the brewing steps that we're going to take and analyze in this lecture in order to, to brew beer? Well, 
The first brewing step that we are going to analyze is the milling. Milling is just crushing grain seeds. And we want to crush those grain seeds because we want to expose the end sperm inside the, inside the, the seed. We want to break the end sperm free from the hole and the seed coat. And after milling, the product that we are going to get, our crushed grain seeds, is called grist. Now, what is endosperm? Well, endosperm is the seed food storage, and it's rich in starch. And the reason why we want starch is because starch is a polysaccharide. It's a long molecule, it's a polymer, and a polymer you have repeating units of uh, a monomer. In this case, our monomer is a glucose, is alpha glucose. And then we have a repeating unit of glucose attached next to each other, something similar to a per necklace. So, these long starch molecules need to break into sugar, into shorter sugar molecules for our yeast to process and be able to produce ethyl alcohol. The next step in our process of making beer is mashing. And for that, we just have to add water. What happens is that our crushed grain, our grist, is treated with hot water in order to form sugar. And mashing consists of three phases. The first one is gelatinization, in which our crushed grain absorbs water and swells. We really need to have good contact between our water molecules and all parts of our starch long chain. Because what we're going to be doing is that we're going to use water to cut those chains, to chop the chains into smaller chains. This process is called hydrolysis. And it's, it's necessary to have good contact between our water molecules and our chain in order to have a, a good hydrolysis. Then, these this hydrolysis is going to occur in two, in two parts. The first part is the liquefaction, in which our starch molecules break into shorter ones, dextrins, and the other phase, the last phase in our mashing process, is the sacrification, in which there is a final conversion to sugar with one, two, or three glucose units. Then for our mashing, yes, we need to add water. We need water for produce our hydrolysis. But in these specific breakup of starch molecules, we need also some enzymes. This whole mashing process is an enzyme facilitated hydrolysis. We are cutting with water molecules, but some enzymes are facilitating that cut of the, of the starch molecule. So we have two enzymes that are going to make our life much easier. The first enzyme that we are going to be analyzing is the alpha amylase. And the alpha amylase does the liquefaction, which is chopping our starch molecule, a long starch molecule, into shorter molecules, but still they are not completely uh, digestible by our yeast. But it's the first step. Well, alpha amylase does is picking randomly a spot in our chain. Let's say let's pick another random spot in our chain and then it facilitates the cutting at those specific points. 
So after Alpha Amylase has done its job, then we have shorter molecules, but they're still too long for genes to, to digest. Pretty much we are just preparing a good meal <laughs> and chopping salad but instead of chopping salad what we're chopping is a starch molecule and our uh main chopper is our alpha amylase then after after alpha amylase has done its job then beta amylase can take part and beta amylase is responsible for saccharification. The main difference between alpha amylase and beta amylase is that alpha amylase pick any point along the chain. Beta amylase, it only nibbles or cuts on the edges of the chain. So if we pick a point, Let's say there we have a, a small point near the, the end of the chain. And what we're going to be finding is that that two unit short sugar has been detached from my starch molecule. So after alpha amylase and beta amylase have done their job, then our long starch molecule that was uh, coiled in a spiral now has been reduced to a set of shorter sugar molecules and those can be processed and digested, eaten by our yeast. After we finish our mashing process, our mixture is going to be called a sweet wort plus some spent grains. Those spent grains we have to filter in our next process, which is the wort separation. And uh, normally these occur into a container, which is called the Lautern Turn. And uh, the Lautern, here we have a nice picture of the interior of a Lautern turn in which grains are circulated in a way that grains get accumulated near a false end in here. What happens is that the sweet wort, the liquid that has this short, shorter glucose, is going to be passing through those spent grains. The grain is going to serve as a filtering, a filtering uh, medium for for the the sweet liquid that is that is resulting from our mashing process. After we filter those grains, the spent grains, we need to boil our liquid. We need to boil our sweet wort. And boiling accomplish five things. First, the steam is going to clear up any untasty compounds. Also, enzymes that were very useful to chop my long starch molecule into shorter sugars. Now we're gonna get the activated by heat proteins that can be present in our in our mixture can coagulate and be removed. Any bacteria that we can have can be killed and also we can have some wild yeast that is that is not needed in our in our beer and we are also go, during boiling are going to be adding hops and resins from hops are going to change their molecular form and can then dissolve into our beer so after boiling our product our mixture is going to be called a hop wort 
Here we have a beautiful picture of the kettle, which is the vessel in which boiling occurs. And this is the kettle in a Port Jeff brewery in Long Island, a place that I had the chance to, to visit during, during early March. So why are we adding hops during boiling? And why, why are hops so important? Well, the flowers of the hop plants produce a yellow powder called lupulin. Here we have a picture that shows the lupulous glands of a female hop plant, which is called H. lupulus. What occurs is that bitter acids are present in these glands, and of course, the bitterness goes into the, the lupulin. During boiling, those bitter acids, those alpha acids from lupulin, are converted into isoalpha acids. Here we have the most common alpha acid that is present in lupulin and is humulin. Humulin, during boiling, the energy, the heat of, of boiling breaks a bond. And the bond that is being broken is this dash bond that we see here. And a new bond is formed between this point and this point and is shown here as a wave. So this is exactly what is happening during boiling and then the end result is a molecule car called isohumulin which is the responsible for bitterness in our beer. Actually bitterness in beer is measured in uh, something called bitterness units. Uh, another unit for bitterness is the International Bitterness Unit. And those are pretty much equivalent to milligrams of this compound, this isohumulin per liter. So it's just a concentration of isohumulin in, in our beer. That's why what they are reporting when they talk about the bitterness units in, in beer. The next step for after boiling is to chill. <laughs> we need to chill our, our beer before we send it to fermentation. And when we're chilling, we want to have a rapid cooling because rapid cooling avoids unwanted flavor here. If we want rapid cooling, we need to move energy. Temperature is just a measure of energy in our material, in any material, in a liquid, in a solid, it's just a measure of the average kinetic energy of the molecules that make this material. So, in order to chill, we have to move energy around. We have to take heat energy out of our uh, boiled beer, out of our hop wort, in order to to decrease its temperature in order to chill it. The energy that we need to take out the hop work is given by this equation, where Q, our capital Q, is the heat, M represents the mass of our hop work, C is the specific heat of hop work, and that's a property of, of materials, and uh, delta T is the change in temperature, is the difference between the final temperature that it has to be smaller than the boiling temperature, which I will say is 100 Celsius. So, if we want to take that heat fast, we need to put a lot of power. Power is a measure, it's a it's a measure of the speed in which we can exchange heat. We can take heat or put in 
heat in a material. And the equation for that is just the change in heat divided by the time interval that took us to, to remove that energy of to put that energy in. So if we want to have a fast cooling, we want to have a rapid cooling, we need to have a small time interval. And if we want to have a small time interval, that means that this power is going to be large. So if we want to have fast cooling, we need to put lots of power. How can we achieve this rapid cooling in an efficient way? Well, there is here a design of a counter current chiller. This is a side view of a pipe. But actually, it's not just a pipe. There are two concentric pipes. Here, we have an inner pipe in which the beer is flowing from the, the right, and the outer pipe is embedding this, this inner pipe and is having water flowing from the left. So what happens is that we have cold water entering here and then we have hot beer entering here. So when this hot beer is reaching this point has been cooled because it has been in contact with water with just with water in the outer in the outer pipe during its whole trajectory. Then what you can see is that this cold beer is still in contact with water, but is the coldest water that you have in your in your setup. The coolest water is the one that is taking heat out the already cooled beer. And then the beer that is coming right off the, of the kettle, that is right straight out of the boiling step, is getting into contact with not so cold water, but still this not so cold water is absorbing, is taking heat out of this high temperature beer and is cooling it down. At all times, the cold material or the cold liquid is taking heat out of the hotter fluid, out of the hot beer. And this is the whole process of a counter current chiller, which is a very, very smart uh, design in order to achieve fast cooling. After a beer has been chilled, then we can proceed with the fermentation. Then our cool work is taken into a fermentation vessels. Here we can see the fermentation vessels at uh, Port Jeff Brewery in Long Island. And we add yeast. And we let yeast do their magic. What yeast does is that it converts sugary water, the, the cool word, into beer. The process, the reaction that uh, is taking place is shown in an, in this equation. Of course, in here is shown with glucose, and when we do beer, it doesn't necessarily has to be glucose. It can be also maltose or uh, um, short sugars that have uh, more than two glucose units, but of course they cannot be particularly large because then, or particularly long, because then yeast is not going to be able to, to digest them. So what happens is that yeast take our glucose, here we have C6H12O6, 
and is going to produce two molecules of ethanol. It's going to take one molecule of glucose and it's going to produce two molecules of ethanol, CH3CH2OH, and uh, two molecules of carbon dioxide. So it produces the gas as a result of the of the intake of, of glucose. Plus ethanol and plus energy. Actually, these it stores sugars in order to obtain energy for their living functions. That's what they do. And the whole process of fermentation is yeast doing their living, eating, taking energy, and existing. As a subproduct, a waste product of that food intake and transformation to energy, then they produce ethyl alcohol. It's a waste product in this process. So this, this um, compound that is so highly appreciated by beer drinkers is just a waste of use in their, their living functions, which is quite interesting. In order to have a good production of ethyl alcohol, we need to let yeast do their living with lots of sugar. Because yeast, normally they need oxygen to multiply, but they do not need oxygen for the fermentation reaction. However, when there is low sugar level in our beer mixture, and uh, they are good oxygen levels, then our yeast can switch to respiration mode. And now they can start consuming oxygen and producing carbon dioxide and water. So if we really want to have a good production of ethyl alcohol, we need to have very, very good levels of sugar for our yeast to produce ethyl alcohol instead of engaging in respiration mode. This is exactly why it's so important to have a good milling process in which we expose the endosperm and we provide plenty of, of starch to our, to our mixture and also to have a good mashing process in which our enzymes can nibble out of the, the long starch molecule smaller sugars that can be digestible for our yeast. The next step after fermentation is condition conditioning. And conditioning is just keep beer in contact with yeast in order for the beer to mature and become clearer. So here we have two different styles of beer which are quite popular the lager beer the pilsner beer is it's a type of, of lager and then also the ale beer i have to, to confess that my favorite uh beer is great lakes christmas ale so that's the the main reason why i pick a, a nail for that picture but also because there is a main difference between the conditioning step for making a lager and the conditioning step for making a, an ale ale because it's not such a light beer it's not a clear beer it doesn't need a long conditioning conditioning it, it will take a few days but that's it however lager which is clear then it needs weeks in order to to complete its its state of of conditioning. Sometimes breweries they allow the conditioning to occur even in the bottle. So when they are packaging your beer, there is still some yeast present, which 
will take care of the conditioning until it reaches your your table and it's ready for you to to enjoy the final step is packaging Ayana, you can package your beer in casks in kegs in bottles or in cans Another step, another important part of packaging is the presence of carbon dioxide in our beer. If you continue uh, allowing yeast to be in contact with, with your beer, the yeast is going to produce carbon dioxide. That is your source of carbon dioxide that is going to be dissolved in your beer. However, if you go and you condition your beer and then you remove as much yeast as possible, then you need to introduce carbon dioxide under pressure, which is exactly the same procedure that you use with a soda stream. When you make sparkling water in a soda stream, what, what you do is you take your water, you place it into the container, and you release uh, you press the container and release carbon dioxide that enters into the water and dissolves some beers they actually use not only carbon dioxide but also nitrogen and the gas mixture that they want to dissolve into the beer and the reason they want to do that is because it would make a more stable foam layer in in your beer. After packaging, the only thing between you and your glass of beer is serving it. And what occurs is that when you serve your beer, you have the dissolved carbon dioxide in your in your liquid is going to nucleate it's going to form bubbles and those bubbles are going to rise to the surface due to the buoyant force. The buoyant force is the force that allows all of us to float and be able to swim. The buoyant force is the force that is exerted by a surrounded liquid, a surrounding liquid, when an external object is introduced in that liquid. In this case, the external object is the carbon dioxide bubble. And the liquid wants to get that carbon dioxide bubble out of the, of the liquid because it's disturbing the equilibrium of the liquid. So it's going to create an upward force, which is the buoyant force. The buoyant force is exactly the responsible of the motion of bubbles that we can see in, in, in this video. Finally, when a bubble races uh, towards the surface and it reaches the surface, then it's going to encounter other bubbles that already went through that path. And this collection of, of bubbles are going to form a form. The foamy layer that decorates our beer when it's served. Foam is more than just an attractive layer on top of, of beer. Actually, foam is a soft material. And it's a soft material because it has some duality. You can uh, drink a beer and uh, the foam is going to flow, it's going to be quite flexible. However, you can also make a, a little uh, drawing in, in the foam with your finger. And this duality between something that it can be manipulated, it can be distorted, but, or something that just flows freely is what characterizes a soft material. What happened with the foam is that you're going to have a, some cool molecules which are called surfactants. And those molecules like to live on a surface. For beer, 
the surfactants that are present are leftover proteins and compound, compounds from hopes. And those leftover proteins and compounds from hopes are going to be located in the surface of your foam bubbles. What occurs is that surfactants, they like to decrease the surface energy of, of a bubble. There is an energy cost in order to, to have a bubble. And if you decrease that energy cost, then your bubble is going to be more stable. And if your bubble is more stable and you live in the surface of the bubble, then you have a place to live. So this is the whole reason why surfactants need to decrease the surface energy and the surface tension of, of, a, of a surface in order for the surface to be stable and then they can exist. So in general, what surfactants do is to reduce the surface energy so the surface becomes stable and they have a place to live. So what is the next step that can a system have in order to minimize the energy cost of existence of a foam? Well, there is a special arrangement of bubbles that can minimize the total area of bubbles in a foam and that specific bubble arrangement corresponds in 2D with the honeycomb structure. This is a, is a problem that has been uh, analyzed and first uh, proposed by Lord Kelvin. First he was called Sir William Thompson then he became Lord Kelvin, and I recently learned that in addition to, to that name, he had he hold the title of the Right Honorable. So this is a highly, highly regarded uh, scientist and mathematician in history. And uh, he was curious about what would be the arrangement, the configuration of, of bubbles in order to minimize the surface and he he created this conjecture that the honeycomb structure will be the optimal configuration to have a perfect form an optimal form these scientists lived between 1824 and 1907 so he died at the beginnings of the 20th century. Then, in 2001, Thomas Hales proved that the honeycomb structure actually corresponds with a bubble arrangement and that will minimize surface energy in a form. So, Almost a century later, <laughs> we uh, another mathematician found the proof of this the honeycomb conjecture. But then, when we think about the foam in a beer, it's really a perfect foam. If we look into zoom in into a picture of a foam, actually that was the most uh, beautiful picture of a foam that I could take during my vacation, what I found is that there are irregularities in the size of the bubbles, in the arrangement of the bubbles. Those are defects are, are, and irregularities. And we can analyze those defects and irregularities in terms of geometry. Physicists like to assign a topological charge to those defects and irregularities. And then, they can analyze the physics of forms in analogy with the physics of electric charges, which is just 
an amazing, an amazing branch of physics and something that is in continuous development and ongoing research. If we, you guys are interested, all you have to do is to go to Google and write topology of forms and you're going to find many, many articles and abstracts and links dedicated to the geometry and topology of forms. And beyond just topology of forms, there is also other uh, research topics in, in, in the physics of forms. And as a taste, here is a session, an undergraduate friendly session in the meeting the march meeting of the american physical society that was taking place between march 2 and 6 at denver colorado it was entirely dedicated to the physics and form of forms from beer to windmills weights and everything in between this was a very very cool session that we were able to listen via zoom due to um coronavirus concern so I hope that I've been able to, to show you that behind simple has simple has uh, attractive, foamy, and delicious glass of beer. There is some serious science involved. And uh, the science is just fascinating. And we can keep going. Science is always a, a working process, pro, in process. And it is present in our everyday life. Every little detail that you can encounter since the moment you open your eyes can be explained, analyzed, and researched with the scientific method. And that's the beauty of the scientific endeavor in new discoveries. So I hope you have enjoyed your your lecture. I honestly hope you you have uh, grasped a couple of, of cool concepts on in the physics and chemistry of beer. And that is the end of our lecture. If you have any questions, just write uh, the question on my Facebook, on the Facebook page for this talk. And I'm looking forward to to talk with you. Cheers to you.